please note that this video contains spoilers. X-Men 2 Movie Thoughts. So we again have the opposing ideas of Xavier and Magneto. And you can really tell the extent. You know, the attack on the mutants by Stryker is of course an extreme reaction to perhaps, among other things, his son's condition and the, the death of his wife. His reaction is to kill all mutants, to kill... It's, it's genocide, really. And Magneto's reaction to this is an equal overreaction. His response is to kill all humans. And when the X-Men get the power to either kill or not kill, you know, a single person, everyone, they simply choose not to kill anyone. I do think that maybe they could have tried to save Jason, but I guess it might have been complicated, and I can see, you know, arguments for letting him die, but... I don't know. He might have been too dangerous, you know, you could argue that he did do the whole trying to kill everyone out of his own will, at least when he thought it was mutants. I don't know. Just wanted to mention it. My girlfriend pointed out that Rogue is better at landing the X-Jet than Scott turned out to be in the first one. We can have very little character development for Scott. He's just kind of there. He doesn't really do anything. And perhaps that segues me nicely, if that's where, into the problem again of these movies, which is all these superpowered people, you have to get some of them neutralized. You have to disable their powers or get them into a position where they can't really do anything. Xavier is, you know, he's indeed the threat here, and Cerebro, you know, both of these first two really focus on Cerebro and Cerebro's power. Although it's more of a, you know, it's, it's slightly different this way. I like what they did this time with taking, you know, we knew that it could find anyone anywhere before, or any mutant anyway, and now it you know it takes that further and says you know maybe it's also an incredibly powerful weapon. The and we have you know Magneto turning a bit more towards you know in the first one he was more of an idealist sort of he was convinced that if he could just make everyone like him it would all work out or every world leader anyway. And in this one, he's willing to actually kill everyone, not like him, not like his kind. He's taking more of a step away from being, you know, the opposite idealist to Xavier and towards being truly someone that you can't, almost can't reason with, you know. He's almost too dangerous to work with. You know, in this one, they we have this kind of shaky alliance between the two. The character arc of Pyro works quite well, I would say. It's, you know, he almost starts out in the same way as Rogue and Iceman. You know, just the, the teenager who's not accepted. And he's just, you know, he, he takes that kind of turn, he doesn't just, you know, decide to join the fight. He actually goes, you know, to the other side. He is now convinced that, indeed, like Magneto says, one of these two groups is going to dominate the other. Humans are too afraid of mutants to let them be, and mutants, you know, by their own, you know, Magneto feels that mutants should be the ones in charge, partially because he's a mutant, you know, ethnocentricity. 
but also, you know, because they are more powerful. The bursting dam works well as a kind of ticking time bomb, which is also always good to have at the end of films like this. You know, have something that, you know, the first one has one as well. Have something that needs to be stopped or you need to escape from, you know, for the big climax. It's also interesting how long the climax is if you really count, you know, they spend a good half hour at the dam, you know, between getting there and getting in there and until they've escaped from it. You know, they actually, the Yuriko Wolverine fight is actually fairly early on. I'd say 20 minutes pass from that before they get away from the dam. And on that, Striker, I do not mind in the least being left. I totally get why they leave him behind. A lot could be said about Jean's sacrifice. You know, there are those that say that maybe it wasn't necessary. I can kind of see where they're coming from. Not entirely sure why she couldn't be lifting the jet from the inside instead of having to be on the outside. But, you know, they really wanted to get to the Phoenix storyline very, very clearly. You know, and, and it's set up right from the very beginning of the film. You know, from when we first see her, we see her powers have grown. The Wolverine arc with him, you know, finding out more about his past, getting some hints, not not that many distinct answers, but some hints at least of where he came from, works pretty well, and it is, you know, he's one of these characters that just works best when you don't know everything about them. You know, you should be making up your own stories about what he did. It's more interesting that way. It's more interesting if you don't know exactly where he came from or exactly why he is the way he is. Just, you know, flashes of what he did back then is sufficient, I would say. We again get great use of the morphing by Mystique. Again, I'd say the best since Terminator 2 in these two movies of shape-shifting to, you know, infiltrate and, you know, get, you know, to, to accomplish something. And I like that they used the actual, you know, natural appearance of the actress whose name escapes me at the moment. Rebecca... something. The... I, I wonder how exactly Magneto and Mystique happen to be in the right place when the jet nearly crashes. I was thinking that maybe they were on their way to the mansion, which definitely makes sense because they know that, you know, they're going to be trying to work. That almost make grammatical sense. They're trying to work with the X-Men, so obviously they'd go to where the X-Men are, and we knew that the jet was on the way to the manor, and it was mansion, and it was close. But it's a little... I don't know, they seem to be flying for a while at high speeds after that, so how exactly they happen to find each other, I'm not sure. But anyway, you know, they had to work with what they had. Having Magneto, for example, fly above the trees might have been a bit much because we haven't really seen, you know, they're trying to be the more realistic, do the more realistic power use to have, excuse me, have the more bound in, you know, our world a bit. The... The image of him 
you know, floating away from the prison with the two metal balls, you know, spinning around him in the kind of atom core look kind of way. It's kind of cool looking, but it does also look a bit awkward to me, maybe because it's McKellen. I don't know, but it has a little bit. But it is a really cool way to get out of there. And of course, Mystique knew how to, you know, knew about the scanners and all that because she got the schematics from the computer and she knew that, you know, strikers, people or whatever had those files on the computer because she, as Kelly, overheard, you know, we're the ones who built the plastic prison, you know, so we have that entire, entire progression makes perfect sense. This is the first time we really see Logan, you know, just go nuts on someone, just, you know, release the rage, and it's just as bad as, as it should be. The attack on the mansion in general just is really cool and, you know, it makes for some good use of powers. You know, we see Colossus with the, you know, we see him, you know, get the steel skin and just, you know, there's that split second where it's, you know, we just look at a wall, nothing's happening, and then they crash through. You know, he tosses some people through a wall. You know, Logan clears plenty of these troops out. We have Iceman creating an entire wall of ice to protect Logan. And we have, I think, Sonar, is her name maybe? Or Siren, something. Scream to, you know, with this piercing scream to stop some of them. Have, has anybody else wondered how these pistols, some of them are pistols, apparently fire, like, bursts? Like, they seem to fire at least three of these darts at any time. And also, aren't some actual guns used? It almost seems like they decided halfway through production that, oh wait, maybe we should use darts instead of bullets. I don't know, maybe, but I'm pretty sure they're firing bullets and not darts at, you know, Iceman when... You know, he ducks, and Logan takes out the guy. We have a recast Kitty Pride. It's kind of funny how she gets recast for each of these movies, but hey, she doesn't actually have a role until the third movie, so I guess that works. Jubilee is also recast, but I suppose you could say she wasn't identified necessarily as Jubilee in the first one, and here it's more clearly her, especially because of that deleted scene where it's really clearly her, and the name drop in the movie itself. The end is a pretty good setup for, you know, future, both with, you know, the president having the speech, and with, you know, Phoenix in the water. But yeah, all in all, quite good. Just unfortunate that they keep having to neutralize these powerful people, you know. Cyclops doesn't do anything for pretty much the entire movie. Xavier doesn't do anything for the entire movie other than be hypnotized gradually. Magneto does get to do some cool stuff and he does have the excuse of being in prison and in the first sequence, so, you know, for the first bit. But yeah, again, they have to keep splitting them up into I like what they did with Logan having some irony over the character because you do kind of have to, after you've spent one movie just solidifying how badass this one character is, you have to have some irony over it or it's going to just get too much, you know. People are going to start making jokes about them. 
this movie does that well, Terminator 2 also does that well, you know, you, you have to do that, you have to bring it down to a level so that it doesn't, because it doesn't have to be so strong that we lose respect for them, such as in the case of Terminator 3. It can be done in a good way so that it works and we still really dig the character, but, you know, Logan, you know, has to babysit and you know, it's this whole, and you know, having a bit more trouble with the women than the first time around. You know, this time, although Rogue still fawns over him, it's still she does follow Bobby, and you know, Jean does. It's pretty much yeah, she does shoot him down. So you know. I do kind of have to wonder why he couldn't smell that it was Mystique, but maybe she hides her scent as well, you know, in the tent. Also not entirely sure why she is into him, because, I don't know, is it a s and M kind of thing? You know, just stab me, that's so hot. I don't know. And although I kind of like that they acknowledge that, you know, there's a relationship between Nightcrawler and Mystique, to my knowledge, they are literally related in the comics, so the almost flirting kind of thing, maybe not, not so much in what is said, but his face and that tail, yeah, dude, get your mind out of the gutter. I'm pretty sure she's your mom, so just no. I like that we do see that Magneto cares about Mystique, you know, he does, you know, turn around, he does make sure to hurry up and stop Jason once, you know, the whole mutant killing thing starts. And Mystique again gets to be a complete and utter badass with, you know, her martial arts fighting skills. Yeah, I guess that's it. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.